Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. That was terrific and so interesting. And some some of us, like me and others, have fought, fought those fights and and made those friends. Appreciate the talk. That was great. And congratulations. And next, it's my um, honor to introduce uh, Ruperto Chaparro, who is the director of Puerto Rico Sea Grant. And um, I've asked um, Chapa to give a view about what happened here and then in introduce um, um, a greeting. So uh, here is Chapa. Gracias, John. Uh, I first want to thank the mayor of San Juan for, for giving me the opportunity to welcome you to Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, bienvenidos a Puerto Rico. I think this is a great honor for us to have so many scientists, students, researchers, and educators here in Puerto Rico and having the opportunity that they can give us some feedback about our problems, about what we're dealing with now. You know, we have been, uh, you can look at the presentation here, which is a movie, a video that was taken two weeks after Hurricane Maria. And last night I said, uh, how am I going to introduce this video? And I received uh, an email from a friend uh, who, that was talking about augmented reality. And I said, what is augmented reality? And it says, it's a, a form of digital art that in this work involves a natural system to draw the attention to ecological issues. And I think this is an excellent opportunity for us to see what is going to happen with climate change, with sea level rise, with winter storms in areas like this is Rincón, Puerto Rico, where they have not respected the laws of nature. When they were starting to develop all these buildings and condos, uh, we went with some friends from scientists and we told them, you know, you're developing in the maritime zone. And they even called us communists because we were against development and against uh, the economy of, of the island. And we were telling them, no, you know, you're just developing in the maritime zone and when we have the next hurricane, you will see what will happen. So they kept giving permits, developers, I don't blame them, you know, developers are to make money, so they don't care what happens after they sell the, the properties they are developing. But people that are staying here in Puerto Rico, just, we start seeing that the sand started to disappear. And Maria just was an acceleration of the future. What it did is telling us, we are in the climate change. We're not waiting for the impacts of climate change. We are already living in a new world where we have sea level rise going on. And we have these examples that you can see that people are more interested in saving their structures than of saving the beaches and the natural resources. In Puerto Rico, for example, all beaches are public. So it's in our constitution that we need to have access to the beach, that the beaches belong to all Puerto Rican for their wise use and enjoyment. And what we're doing is we're privatizing and really leaving our next generations without a natural resource that is of first quality and that could be giving them more income if we manage it the way we're supposed to do it. So you can look at all the condos, all the development that was going on here that has been uh, damaging our important resources, which are the beaches. And, you know, when people see me now, they say, oh, you know, you were telling us that this was going to happen. And I am not glad that this happened because what it really means is that we destroy the future and the opportunities of our next generations to make money from this resource that belongs to all of us. So looking at this video, you will learn that 
it's not only nature, it's also bad decisions from the managers of the resources because they are the ones that have to tell people you cannot develop here, you have to go back. And this problem will keep going on. You know, we had the experience during Maria. I, I say that Puerto Ricans invented the word resiliency. Uh, I don't know if you can imagine to be six months without electricity, you know? You can be three months without water. You can live three months without cell phones. And we survived. We're still waiting for FEMA to send the funds to help Puerto Rico. They have sent less than 20% of the funding that is expected to be uh, received here. But we are still standing up. And we did that because our culture is ingrained that we, you have to help your neighbors. So the first help after the hurricane came from the neighbors. All the neighbors got out. What do you need? Did something happened to your house? Let's start cleaning the roads. Let's start, do you need water? Do you need whatever, gasoline for the uh, generators? You know, we are all experts now in generators and the use of generators. You know, we were waking up every morning to change the oil of those generators because people don't understand that you have to be maintaining them all the time. And look at this, what we have. It looks like if it's Beirut after the war, what we have here in our beaches. And the worst problem is that one year and a half after Maria, those places are looking the same. Sun has not come back. The buildings are still there, broken. The insurance company has not paid. And then you start asking, and the economic resiliency of the municipality of Rincón, for example, that depends on the quality of our beaches to make a living. Look at these buildings, you know? Buildings that broke in half. We, we had there in the buoy of Caricus that the waves were 30 feet high. There was an old guy living in that uh, condo that told me, you know, I stayed at, at the condo because I said, this is safe here. We put uh, pilings in front, rocks, so nothing will happen. He told me that he lives in the third floor and the waves were breaking in his balcony. So uh, they have to take him out of there. It's the, the yellow building there. They are still trying to stabilize that building. The other buildings, they are trying to demolish them, but the insurance company is not paying, so they are still negotiating on that. And it's really sad when you look at that kind of impact that Maria had, because those resources the beach, people that rented their Airbnbs and the hotels have to give money back to the tourists because they say, this is not what was in your brochure. I cannot walk the beach, you know? So, so we are experiencing that climate change is here. It's not that it's coming. We are already living that. And this is a good example of what was going to happen in 50 years that we were expecting the sea level rise to be up uh, three feet. So we had this experience in one day. After Maria, we had that reality. We are now in a reality check that we said, you know, we don't have a beach anymore. It costs $60 million to put sand back to those beaches. Uh, we have made some studies uh, at Sea Grant and with Caricus and with Coastal Zone Management Program. And, you know, you really say resiliency, you do it before the event. We had a lot of workshops for employees of the civil defense. We have in Sea Grant a lot of workshops together with other uh, 
offices of Noah, and really we had about two or three deaths after the hurricane. But then it's when you say the ones that were not ready was the government, because we lost 3,000 people died for not having electricity for six months, for not having water. And that is the biggest impact that we had. It was not related to being strong enough and know what we had to do to manage the, the natural event. You know, after the hurricane, everybody was happy outside and we said we survived, so let's start drinking and cleaning here because we are very happy in Puerto Rico. No, you know, people are still dancing and drinking and having fun, but we learned that we are by ourselves, that we cannot expect to receive help from somewhere else. We have to do things by ourselves. Our neighbors are very important. The diaspora is very important. Americans that live in, in Rincón for some time, they were very helpful because they started sending money, sending clothing, sending food, because they could not come here for winter as they do every year but they were doing it because they have friends here and they feel that like they are part of our community. And I just want to thank ASLO for selecting Puerto Rico to be the, the place where they are conducting this conference, which is very important, you know, having 52 countries, having so many scientists and students and teachers here is of a great pleasure for Puerto Rico and I want to thank you again.